Hello everyone in the EDAP 689 class, the class that Mayer built. Uh, again, I apologize for yesterday. I, I, I am totally flummoxed and uh, I filed a, a complaint with Blackboard Ultra, uh, Collaborate Ultra, excuse me. Collaborate is not a part of Blackboard. Uh, just like VoiceThread is not a part of Blackboard. It's what's called an LTI. In other words, when you go and launch that, you actually leave the Blackboard environment and you go to an app that somebody else is in charge of. So when I called today and asked what had happened, our Blackboard people um, at U of L basically are like, well, we don't know. We don't know what's going on. So they gave me the, the information and the form to fill out to complain. So I've done that. So what we're going to try to do tonight is I'm going to divide this into two pieces because I think there is so much in this that I need to divide into two pieces so I can do it justice um, because there's a lot about mayor before we get to the 12 principles. And that's what I really want to do tonight is make sure you understand the underpinnings of where his principles come from. Now, let me tell you that when I started teaching this class, when I first created it about nine years ago, Mayer only had nine principles. Now we're up to 12. And then there was one year where he went up to 11, and then he went back down to 10 the following year. So this, this is not set in stone, but the basis, the idea is, and that's what we're going to do tonight. And then next week, we'll go through um, the 12 principles. And then we'll talk about how we're going to do our part of the book study in uh, VoiceThread. So here we go. Let me bring this up. And one of the things that you need to understand is when we go into here, we need to stop for a second and talk about something called cognitive learning theory, because that becomes the basis of what Mayer bases his cognitive learning theory of multimedia learning. Okay, so I'm going to jump over here to this website. Now, Richard Mayer is not an educator. Richard Mayer is a cognitive psychologist. And so once you understand that, and then when you start seeing this, what comes with the 12 principles and everything else that flows that from then on out, then it starts to make sense to you. So when you talk about cognitive psychology, you're basically looking at how our brains, the schema, work. And what do they do to understand new information? And let's stop for a second here. So cognitive theory of learning. There are other theories of learning. One of the, one of the ones that I firmly am in the camp of is constructivism, where we build new learning upon the foundation of prior learning. And Mayer, Mayer will acknowledge this in his work. I find it kind of interesting. But he remains solidly in the cognitive psychology camp, where it's believed that actively, actively engage with and organize information is what we do to give it meaning. We practice and rehearse information we make connections to what is already known, and we're in an environment that supports learning, takes on tasks within their zone of proximal development. Can you say Vygotsky? So, you know, here's where he's, this is where his principles grow out of. When you look at what they study, they study attention, perception, 
semantics and episodic memory, language development and use, concepts and categorization, reasoning and decision making, problem solving, procedural and conceptual learning, consciousness, skill acquisition. So within this big long list here is, you know, probably a thousand if not more dissertations that people have done. Are you starting to see it? So the top layer is, here's the definition. This is what cognitive psychology would, would talk about when they talk about cognitive learning theory. Here's the different pieces of it that are studied. And then we have this piece down here, information processing. Cognition is computation. So computation cognition states that our mental functions that our, that our mental functions act as a complex computer. This is new, by the way. There is input, processing the input in terms of existing schema and an output. Now remember what is schema? Schema is nothing more than the mental process that we use to understand something. That's all. Now when we look at this through information processing, we see the computational equivalence of multiple re, re <laughs> uh, let me back up. What we're looking at here is what is the output? What are the inputs? But how do they, how are they done through different processing techniques? You'll see here in just a second, this is straight up. This mayor took this one to heart. And then technological tools that can change how learners think. Again, this piece down here is, you'll see, reflected here in just a second. We go visit Mr. Mayor. Now, now we have this sort of understanding here that what we're talking about is cognitive theory. And that cognitive theory gets broken down into these parts, this definition. And then here are the ways that people study this. So what I want you to think about is which one of these represents mayor or do multiples of these, because obviously you can. So multiples of these represent mayor. Now let's jump back into here and let's now go and look at mayor. So what mayor is trying to do is he's very much in that camp of cognitive learning theory. But what he's trying to do is he wants to adapt it, adopt it, adapt it to multimedia learning. So let's look at how he does that. First of all, he states, hello, processes processes. He states that there are two primary ways that we process information in multimedia. If we can agree that multimedia is words and pictures. I don't think there's any, you know, do we have a problem with that? I don't think there's any problem with defining it that way. Here's where it gets interesting. You as a human being have evolved to recognize something in about six seconds. Now, that doesn't mean someone like me, who has a severe visual problem, that I can resolve in six seconds that it's you standing across campus, but I can resolve in six seconds there's a person standing over there. And you can see how this happens. You know, if you were if we were on the savanna in Africa, what, three million years ago, it really comes in handy that when we look at something, we can resolve in six seconds that there's something there. And we can resolve, is that something going to try to kill me and eat me, or am I going to try to kill it and eat it? So we have that built into us, wired into us, this ready ability to recognize something. But we also have ears. And so what Mayer says is that pictures are seen by the eyes and words 
are also seen by eyes, but they're also heard. And then what we see is that we see that this comes in as sounds, and we get this images as well, and there's this sort of play back and forth. Do the sounds match the images? Do the words match the images? And then what happens is, and this is where it gets really interesting, this is Mayer, all in here. Because one of the things that we have found through studying the human brain, you can't have more than seven things going on in your working memory at any given time. You just can't. And so what happens is the brain just sort of tosses things out. In other words, it's, well, I, I can't get that, so I'm just going to lay it aside. Or it tries to make sense of it and focuses on that, whatever it might be, and then you lose everything else. That's in working memory. That's like if you were sitting in class and I put something up on the board that had seven words and seven definitions, and I give you a certain amount of time to then be able to give back to me those seven words, those seven definitions without looking at it. Okay? So when we see in working memory that limitation, what happens is your brain then takes things, the organizing of the words, and they put that into verbal mode. And by that we mean I can say the word. Now, one of the things you see with little kids, I have an 18-month-old um, great-nephew that comes and spends the day with us because his parents very widely realize that if you put your child in the care of a former teacher, a former good teacher, my wife, former great teacher, then it's going to be a lot better because you don't need to have socialization until you're about three. He's going to be better off. What's been fascinating is watching him with words. And we all know this. You're around little kids. You see it all the time. So when he wants to play, he wants to play with his nay -nays. Those are horses. He calls them nay -nays. If he wants to play with his cars, he calls them car car. He calls my dog, Wilson. He calls him a dog dog. And so you can see he is organizing words based upon how he has interpreted them, his verbal mode. Now, for some strange reason, <laughs> right out of the box, he started calling me Steve. But that doesn't really strike me as all that unusual. I worked with kids, my goodness, I worked with kids with IQs, you know, two standard deviations uh, below the norm, and to a one, they all called me Steve. They were able to catch that. I don't know if it's the combination of the letters or the sounds. Steve just seems to be some people can say. So he got me right away. He has not gotten my wife. He still calls her mama. So in his mind, that verbal mode, it hasn't settled in yet. Now, you'll see this in kindergarten when a teacher is trying to teach something that's an analogy and kids don't have the verbalness to have the ability to put that analogy into perspective. So you'll see things like a teacher will say to children when they're trying to teach the letter sound of ilm, m, she'll say, what sound does a cow make? Of course, what you're trying to hear back is moo. And kids will bark. They'll make cat noises. Because how many kids have in their working memory, in fact, in their long-term memory, the experience of hearing a cow? So it, it doesn't compute. And so what we see happens is, and let's carry this all the way through, so you have this organizing images, the same thing. Show a kid who's never been around a cow, a picture of a cow, and they have, a hard, they, they have to really work at getting that into their head. It's a cow. Why is it a cow? Well, 
right? And so we, we see this all the time. What I find so fascinating is he has never, never called his iPad anything except iPad. And he says things, he does not say words yet, but he says things with the inflection in his voice that tells you, and again, I saw this all the time with my kids that I worked with, their inflections and their voices took the place of questioning or asking questions or needing something. So he'll say, I want no iPad. And he, you know he's saying he wants his iPad. Now, of course, you reinforce that because you give him the iPad. But I find that fascinating that he's never had any other word for the iPad. So here we are. We're in verbal mode and pictorial mode. And this goes back to this. So this has to come through all of this before it gets to here. When it gets to the integration piece, we're hoping that the pictorial model mode and the verbal model mode make sense so they can be integrated. Then the last step, according to Mayer, is prior knowledge. To my point about if you've never seen a cat, or I mean, you've never seen a cow, or you've never seen things that you are then presented with, you have a hard time because you don't have any prior knowledge to then be able to base it upon. And so it either gets hardwired in as the new knowledge, or we have to go back and fill in these missing pieces here. Now, once it makes its way through all of this, it then goes into the long-term memory and then becomes a part of the prior knowledge pool. Simple as that. Now, one of the things that people kind of don't get about Mayer is over here at the very beginning of this, what he says is words can either be spoken or they can be in text. Pictures can be static pictures. They can be animations. They can be movies. If in here and here, if things don't come together in here, it gets rejected. Now, one of the thing, one of the points that he makes, which I find fascinating, is he says words, spoken words, and text, because you're looking at it with your eyes, text, and you're hearing it, words, that I call it crossing the streams. And your brain has a hard time, especially then when you introduce pictures. So the interplay between text, words, pictures has to be extremely tight. The other thing I want to make clear as we go through the stuff that's in here from Mayer, and this is one of my criticisms of him, he does an awful lot of talking about, and if you, I'll show you the video. He talks a lot about uh, animations for people to understand things. And he talks, he, he frames a lot of the stuff he talks about as if it were PowerPoints. He doesn't mean PowerPoints. He isn't exclusive to PowerPoints. Remember, he's a cognitive psychologist. He's not an educator. And so when we talk about it, yeah, we can talk about PowerPoints. That's fine. Fair game. But we can also talk about things like brain pop. We can talk about things like utilizing YouTube videos in our classroom. We can talk about it uh, through the lens of utilizing FEP, simu FET, excuse me, sim simulations in our classrooms. We have lots and lots and lots now of multimedia. It's not just this one thing of uh, PowerPoints. Humans can only process a little, a finite amount of information in a channel at one time. And they make sense of the incoming information by actively creating mental representations. Let me repeat that. Humans can only possess a finite amount of information 
in a channel, hello, channel, at one time. They make sense of incoming information by actively creating mental representations over here that is in the working memory. If you don't have a basis for making the mental representations, this all gets very confused because you're, you're trying to see how these two things fit together and then organizing them into here and in here. At the same time, you're trying to pull back some prior knowledge that you don't have. So you have three memory stores. You have sensory, which receives stimuli and stores it for a very short period of time. In other words, that in six seconds you see something. So that's one type of memory he talks about. Working memory, where we actively process information to create mental constructs or schema. Remember schemas? Remember schemas? Back over here. Okay. So when we're trying to do that, that it then should lead to the long term, the repository of all things learned. His theory of learning through multimedia presents the idea that the brain does not interpret a multimedia presentation of words, pictures, and auditory information in a mutually exclusive way. Instead, he maintains these elements are selected and organized dynamically to produce logical mental constructs. He also underscores the importance of learning based upon the text, the testing of content and demonstrating successful transfer of knowledge when new information is presented. So we have three levels of memory. Oh, I saw you the other day. Trying to make sense. You are the student that is in my, I'm the student who's in your 690 class, Steve, dummy. Right, you're in my 690 class from last year. Okay, so th that's Mayor. This whole idea is his cognitive theory of multimedia learning is focused on how we take in information, how we interpret it, how we make sense of it, and then how do we apply it so that it will then become long-term memory? Um, I don't know if you've had 688, but if you've had 688, uh, that pretty much sums up understanding by design. All understanding, all education is students' demonstrations of understanding with transfer. Mayor here says, sure, fine, whatever, but it's also the way your brain works. <laughs> So when you look then at what we're going to be looking at, I've gone ahead and put in chapter number one. I put it in here as a link to a PDF, but I also put it in here as the chapter itself. I would really like you to read this. His first statement in here that people learn best from words and pictures than from words alone is one of the things that underlies everything he does. And if you stop and think about it, how did you learn to read? You sat with somebody, hopefully, and you sat with a book and they basically went through the book and pointed at pictures and pointed at words. Dog, cat, Berenstein bear. Right. That's how we start putting together the pieces that help us then learn to read. What he's trying to do is he's trying to say that instruction has 
historically been the printed word. Thanks to this wonderful 21st century that we live in, pictorial forms of instruction are becoming more and more widely available and accepted. But he cautions that just simply adding pictures to words does not guarantee an improvement in learning. All multimedia presentations are not equally effective. And that's where the 12 principles come in. He goes on in his book um, that he explains how those have to be present before you can really have a multimedia presentations that teaches. PowerPoint is a multimedia presentation that does not teach. It was never designed to be that. PowerPoint was designed, it was actually bought from another company when Microsoft uh, bought it back in the day when they first created Office. It was bought as a presentation tool to convey data, graphs, charts, bullet points. It was never designed to teach. He argues that if we become aware of how people learn, how they learn from words and pictures, then when we use words and pictures, then we know that learning can take place. And so what he talks about down here about the four criteria, he's basically talking about how we can, how researchers can look at this, his multimedia learning cognitive theory. Okay. Um, let's see what else he says. So he goes on, he talks about how people learn, which we just went over. And then he uses this thing over here. And he's talking about in this example, he's, he's had this example in every one of the books he's ever written. This is how the lightning formation. And one of the things that I used to do in class is I would give you this. Right out of his book. And I would say to, to you when you were reading this, look at what the pictures are look at the words, and then at the end, you're going to take a test. And so then he talks over here about his dual channel assumption, that the fact that we process things separately through auditory and um, visual, that what we have to be careful about is that those auditory and verbal channels, that visual pictorial channel, that they make sense. And down here, he talks about there's this assumption, which we already said, there's dual channels, limited capacity, and active processing. I always have maintained that constructivism, a learning theory created by a gentleman by the name of John Abbott, constructivism isn't a theory, it's reality. Because if you look at how he kind of describes it here, when he calls it active processing, he means constructivism. He's saying humans engage in active learning by attempting to relevant incoming information, organizing selected information into coherent mental representations, and then integrating mental representations with other knowledge. Hello, that's called constructivism. And you do this every single day. The first time you get something new, and I don't care what that new is, it could be a piece of technology, it could be a new computer, it could be a new phone. Uh, it could be a new um, television set. It could be a new microwave, a new oven, a new dishwasher, a new washing machine, a new piece of clothes. Clothes. What do you have to do? You have to sit down and figure out how it works based upon the knowledge you carry into the new information. You know, the first thing we do when we get a new phone 
is we look on the side of it for the power on button. And where is the volume uh, two buttons? And where do I plug it in to charge it? And oh my goodness, up comes the OS. And okay, I knew how to operate the OS in my previous phone. Let's start looking for the different apps and go into the settings and all that and try to figure it out. It's hilarious to watch someone jump from one kind of phone to another kind of phone, be it Android over to iOS or iOS uh, down to Android, um, and just watch the confusion. I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just saying it's a perfect example of what he's talking about here. Same thing with when you get uh, a new appliance. And, of course, what's really bad is as we get new stuff, the new stuff is, always has to be different, always has to change, because that's just the way technology is. I'm going to let you keep reading this. I think I've given you the, the skinny, if I may borrow Dr. Fullen's line again. Um, he goes into a lot of, this is not hard reading, okay, it's just reading. He goes into a lot of detail about the assumptions that he makes. And then there's our wonderful graphic that we started out with right here. Okay. Now, if you get done and you're like, what? Here you go. Here you go. I will say that when you watch this, after you get mayor into your head, you can come back. By the way, once you get mayor into your head, you will never be the same person again when it comes to watching uh, like PowerPoint presentations or actually watching any kind of multimedia because you will now know. You will now know what is going on there that makes no sense whatsoever. You know, already we can say, you know, PowerPoints are the worst thing in the world have to come in and watch a PowerPoint on disaggregating data is torture. Is torture. Because, think about it, you have two channels for receiving information. You have a limited capacity. So the one channel, the visual, is seeing whatever is up on the screen, probably a chart. The auditory channel, though, is being bombarded with someone talking and then you trying to read the words or the data points up on the screen. Just that alone, you've maxed out your capacity for hearing and understanding the words that you're seeing, especially if people have a bad habit of wandering off. In other words, not sticking to what the data is showing and not making the connections. That's another mayor. Remember, I told you about it just a minute ago. If you're not making the connections, your audience then just doesn't get it. So this video is a really good video here. I'll play just a little bit of it. I'll let you watch it. And this is straight out of mayor. Uh, back in 2001, it hasn't changed all that much. But if you still need understanding about what we've just talked about, there it is. Okay, it's good stuff. What we'll do is next week, I'll come back in. You don't have to do anything for uh, next week in terms of something in the module, except either read, I would read, and then I'd come down here and I'd watch this. This is really well done, by the way. And that's, again, it's one of the things. You know, uh, if you look at this, let me, let me start it again. Have you noticed how he's just using visuals and he's talking to you? Your working memory is full. What does this mean for a normal student? Most of what you learn at school comes in through two senses, the eyes. Okay. This is a very good presentation because it follows Mayer's rules. Okay. What this is right here is this is Mayer. This is Richard Mayer, this guy right here. And this is his entire presentation about multimedia learning. If you click on it, you'll see that it is one hour 
and 24 minutes. And it's taken right out of his book. It is probably the worst example of the media instruction that I can come up with. And the fact he's turning back to the screen and talking to it violates every rule there is about multi, about PowerPoint presentations. It's hilarious. So you don't have to watch that if you don't want to. But here you go. There's our mayor's principles explained again in a format where it just makes sense. It's extremely well done. Okay. really well done here and then below that here is mayor's principles explained where we get a nice listing of them what they represent and by the time you get done watching that video this makes sense okay the way it kind of states right here is kind of like what what are you talking about but if you watch this first this makes perfect sense now what this is down here is I included this and we'll be using this for our um, assignment, what we have to do when we get ready to go into VoiceThread and create it. What I want you to do as you're reading and watching all this information about the principles is if you will please be thinking which one of those uh, principles kind of makes you go, huh. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to allow you to get away with using spatial and temporal contiguity principle. You'll see they mean nothing. I mean, they're just kind of, you just kind of look at them and go, really, Richard? Really? Really? But everything else on here, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, 11 and 12, I'll kick them out too. So 4, 5, 11, and 12, we're going to kick out. And we'll go over this next week when we go through all this. They're, they're just one of those, well, okay. You know, you don't really have to think too hard about them. But the others are, are fair game for us using them to complete the assignment. Okay, I hope I've done a good job tonight of helping you see Mayer's cognitive theory of multimedia, that words and pictures that are we call multimedia must pass through the schemas that we use to understand knowledge and we have to have them make sense, meaning making. And if we try to put too much, because we have now have learned that our memory capability is fairly low, um, we then can start seeing how multimedia presentations must, must at least adhere to that. And then we also have to realize that lack of prior knowledge, lack of prior knowledge will trump all of this, no matter how good a job you do. But lack of prior knowledge trumps everything that you set out to do. Okay, as always, if you have any um, questions, concerns, uh, I will have this posted. Uh, here in a few minutes, and uh, just text me at 502-457-2937. Don't worry, next week we will go through very carefully the uh, how to do voice thread and how you're going to post it uh, into your wiki, and then how you'll take that wiki page address and put it over into the assignment. As always, I'm always here for you, 502 457 2937. Talk to you next week.